And good Friday morning to you. Uh, and today, as I promised, we're going to have a really, really powerful program. Uh, the watchword today is political corruption. <laughs> That's kind of like the watchword every day, but political corruption is what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to look at some significant corruption. Uh, and uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be talking with a, uh, a person here. You're familiar with her. Uh, but this material you're going to hear today has never, ever been published or broadcast. Uh, and it is the culmination of several years of intense research. Now, what I'm talking about, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting that the program that we're doing is falling on the day that it is today, October the 28th. Because uh, Special Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald had an indictment in his hand Friday morning and was standing before District Judge Thomas Hogan, who must sign off on the first official charges in the leak of a CIA operative's identity more than two years ago. Now, uh, I'm reading this article from Fox News. Washington Post reporter Carol Leonig told Fox News that Fitzgerald was set to present the charge against Vice President Dick Cheney's top aide, uh, Louis Scooter Libby, late Friday morning. Now, the indictment was expected to charge Libby with a felony for making false statements to mislead the grand jury. This is just the tip of the iceberg, folks. Now, Fox News has learned that Libby will step down as Cheney's chief of staff and a replacement will be named as early as Saturday. The vice president's office will release a statement when the indictment is handed down. President Bush is expected to remark on the case in this, uh, in this afternoon today. Now, the charge is based on the assertion that Libby was not up front with the grand jury about when he first learned the identity of CIA operative Valerie Plain, sources told Fox News on Friday. Libby had first told the grand jury that he learned her identity from reporters, but his own notes later showed he learned her identity from Cheney. Now, Carl Rove, President Bush's top political aide, is being spared from criminal charges on Friday, but the possibility he would later be charged remained open. This is very interesting, folks. Now, the special counsel has advised Mr. Rove that he has made no decision about whether or not to bring charges and that Mr. Rove's status has not changed. Mr. Rove will continue to cooperate fully with the special counsel's efforts to complete the investigation. We are, conf uh, we are confident that when the special counsel finishes his work, he will conclude that Mr. Rove has done nothing wrong. That's according to Rove's attorney, Robert Luskin, who uh, said in a statement that he released Friday. Now, reports have indicated that Fitzgerald would keep Rove under investigation. According to a source familiar with the court, the grand jury set to expire on Friday is a regular grand jury that has already had one extension of its term. It cannot be extended beyond this day. That means that Fitzgerald would have to call for a new jury or simply proceed without any jury at all if he wanted to continue the pursue rove. So you see how this game is played. This is a, this is a game. Documents relating to the case were expected to be released at or shortly afternoon Eastern Daylight Time on Friday. The documents were being uh, released at the Department of Justice and the U.S. District Court. Now, last week, Fitzgerald set up a website for the public to view documents relating to the investigation. Fitzgerald is holding a 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Conference, which is about noon today here, uh, Mountain Time, uh, to discuss the grand jury's activities. The White House said it would comment on Friday's activities after Fitzgerald speaks. Now, that is just the, uh, the surface of the magnitude of this problem. Okay, and uh, living true to our name, a closer look, we are going to take a closer look at what's really going on here. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, this, you know, sure, a couple of people got killed in the outing of Valerie Plame, uh, but so what? Well, I got to tell you that it goes much, much deeper than that. Now, as we know, Patrick Fitzgerald is a special prosecutor on the what is being dubbed as the Plame, Plame Gate incident. Now, significance of Plame Gate in the bigger picture destroyed a global weapons of mass destruction search team, okay, which is kind of a pattern of the Bush crime family cabal in the last 50 years. We're talking about conspiracy, collusion, cover-up. Now, the, we are going to be looking at, some, for example, one angle that we're going to be doing today. We're going to be looking at core sets of patterns, okay, and also the same high-level operatives, about 50 to 200 of them, old and new organizations, and a new cadre of indebted, controlled foot political soldiers. That is what lies ahead on the program today. 
because I will be joined here momentarily by Indira Singh. Now, as I said before, you'll know that name, Indira Singh, because, uh, and I'm just going to give you kind of a real short recap of who she is. Uh, Indira is a IT specialist, and she was working for J.P. Morgan Chase Bank in New York. She had been contracted by them to design a, an artificial intelligence software system that would work in real time in Chase Manhattan's uh, uh, banks all over the world, and it would be something that would detect fraud at the teller level or what have you. Uh, and it was through that job, that contract that she had, that she learned about a company in Boston called p -Tech. Well, what you've heard so far uh, is just, uh, again, it's just scratching the surface of a much, much bigger picture. And that is what we're going to be talking with her about today. As I said before, this, this material has never been made public. It's never been uh, broadcast before. So you're going to hear it here first on this program. So without further ado, let's go to my guest, Indira Singh. Good morning, Indira, and thank you for being with me on the program today. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for having me back. No problem. Uh, now what I did was I, saw, I started out here talking about this, uh, this grand jury and the Plain Gate uh, investigator, Paul Patrick Fitzgerald. Right. And we're talking about, you know, the idea that, as, as, uh, as I understand it, uh, Libby Scooter is probably definitely going to be indicted today, but they're holding off on Carl Rove. But the other, the, the kicker here, what I find really interesting and puzzling, is that the grand jury's term expires today. That's so the, the only way that they can continue an investigation of Carl Rove is to do it either, you know, kind of solo without a grand jury, which I don't think is going to happen. Uh, and what I'd like to do is let's let's back into this uh, conversation that we're going to have today. Let's start out with Patrick Fitzgerald. Who is this character? Well, Patrick Fitzgerald is someone that I've had in my crosshairs um, since he um, was involved with the quote-unquote prosecution of an al-Qaeda uh, someone uh, connected with Al Qaeda, in, and in August 2003, he um, led the prosecution into this person. But his um, affiliation with um, terror and in, in, uh, Al Qaeda, shall we say, based terror, goes way back. He, for instance, um, <clears throat> prosecuted uh, World Trade Center 93, Sheikh Rahman. And um, after that, he um, served on a team of prosecutors investigating Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. After that, he served as chief counsel in prosecutions related to the 98 um, <clears throat> U.S. Embassy bombings in, in Tanzania and Kenya. So um, after 9-11, he shows up, and the very first 9-11 al-Qaeda-related um, a prosecution in the United States was um, to someone who ran uh, a Benevolence International Foundation. This person is Enam Arnaut. That's A R N A U T. Mm -hmm. And your listeners can, <clears throat> you know, look up the significance of that. When he gave Enam Arnaut basically um, a free pass for the connections to Al Qaeda and therefore 9/11, I knew we were in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> Uh, here's how that happened. Benevolence International Foundation is mentioned in 9-11 lawsuits. Um, uh, the one, they're on the uh, terror list, the U.S. Des uh, list of designated um, <clears throat> terror charities, and they're listed in the trillion-dollar lawsuit brought by Motley Ness and, and Gershon against um, the Saudis and, um, <clears throat> and also another 9-11 lawsuit. So Benevolence International Foundation is huge. It's big. It was based in Chicago, but it had arms in Boston and down in Texas. Enel Marnot was um, their main operative. <clears throat> um, Patrick Fitzgerald has has uh, been appointed or showed up at every significant um, uh, terrorist-related event in this country's history. Right. And um, you would think that he has the inside uh, architecture um, and the links of, of these people um, very well understood mm -hmm. uh, by the time of the, his prosecution in 2003. And indeed he has, and that's exactly why he's significant. Because he, um, I believe, the, uh, he, he basically um, got the judge to pin uh, the fact, the charges that he was sent to jail for, or not was sent to jail for, was just basically the, 
misutilization of charity funds. He um, <clears throat> uh, sent to the charity the funds that were received to um, Muslim fighters in Bosnia and Chechnya. Right. Hardly a 9/11 indictment. Mm-hmm. When that happened, as you know, I was um, working with uh, someone in Senator Grassley's office, um, a Secret Service agent, and because uh, the way we get these is by tracking the money, financial right. crimes, right. and Secret Service, you know, is the Department of Treasury, but also it's it, it's more than that. Um, I believe he was um, appointed to find out what what I knew and to clear it and to cover tracks. Mm-hmm. So I told him basically uh, that I was going to lay low and not name names and not get, you know, stop my investigation and, and my, you know, connecting the dots with the P-TECH situation if, depending on what happened with Enam or not. Right. When Enam or not was given 10 years just for, you know, oops, I sent the money to Chechnya instead of somewhere else, mm-hmm. um, and Patrick Fitzgerald was a prosecutor there, I knew that this country was in serious trouble, yeah. really serious trouble. And I was looking at an email that I sent to the Secret Service agent. I sent it in August 19, 2003, and I said, the deal's off, the bet's off. I said, there this stinks of a cover-up. I don't know how big the cover-up is yet, but I'm going to find out. And the deal's off. I'm going to name names. I'm going to start talking, and, and, uh, and, and I did. Okay. Um, Indy, hold that right there. Indira, hold that right there. We're going to take our break. When we come back, we will continue, okay? Okay. All right. Indira Singh is my guest. And, folks, again, brace yourselves. You're, you're, you're going to hear quite a story today. Uh, and as I said before, this has not ever been broadcast or released in the public venue. You're hearing the culmination of a, a, a several-year-long investigation uh, by Indira Singh, my guest. And this does go to some very, very interesting and high places. We're going to take our break. When we come back, we will continue. I'm Michael Corbin. You're listening to A Closer Look. Just have a closer look. And again, joining me this morning is my guest, Indira Singh, a very courageous lady. Uh, She has foregone a a very lucrative career to get to the truth about what happened on 9-11. And I can tell you, folks, uh, her, her life has been an interesting journey since then, and she has really penetrated what I, I believe to be. Uh, the real action uh, and the real the real cabal about what is in charge, who's in charge, and where all of this goes. Uh, and as you as I've said earlier, uh, you know this thing about Valerie Plame and the Plame Gate incident is just the tip, literally the tip of the iceberg. Indira, welcome back, and again, thank you for coming on the air today. Thank you, Michael. Let's uh, let's go to uh, the uh, let, let, let's start here first of all. What is the significance of Plame Gate in the bigger picture? Um, Plane Gate um, was the it, well, basically Valerie Plane, wife of um, uh, Joe Wilson, ambassador to Niger, um, was a CIA operative, and she her outing by um, Cheney Rove and uh, and, and company um, destroyed a global. Weapons of mass, WMD, weapons of mass destruction search team, a global one. Yeah. These are the good guys that would catch uh, terrorists um, who may have weapons that we don't want them to have, such as neutron bombs. Right. Um, now, this was strategically masterminded at a very high level. The same names come up, and again, this will, the significance in my, in my mind, the most important part is that it brilliantly shows the pattern of the Bush, what, what, for lack of a better word, the Bush crime family cabal the last 50 years. Their pattern of conspiracy, collusion, and cover-up uh, utilize the same core set of patterns, the same high-level operatives. We think 50 to 200 right. different levels, all the new organizations and um, political foot soldiers. But at the highest level, um, we, we see Michael Ledeen, uh, an Iran-Contra op. I think uh, the tactical direction was by Karl Rove, and foot soldiers even include Ladine's daughter, Simone. Um, and the reason uh, this is kind of interesting because it ties back to uh, earlier shows, the publicity, the, the, uh, the actual outlet that outed it was Jeff, none other than Jeff Gannon, mm. um, the White House uh, uh, prostitute, male prostitute, uh, talent news agency, which was funded by Bobby Everly um, of GOP USA. And, um, you know, his uh, Leadership Institute gave Gannon his land speed record two-day journalism degree. They stuck him in the White House, and his one of his sterling um, 
uh, tasked was to um, publicize the outing of uh, Val- Valerie Plain. Now, um, going back to Michael Ledeen, this right after 9-11, um, one of the things about this uh, cabal is we know it's bipartisan, we know it's transnational, and indeed this involved Italy, um, the Niger, and other countries. Mm-hmm. And members of Bush 41's Iran-Contra operative, Ledeen Gorbanifor, Gorbanifor is or was an Iranian arms dealer with heavy ties to the Mossad who facilitated Iran-Contra. And um, Berlusconi Panorama magazine, which passed the forged documents to the U.S. press. Um, we go back to a well-publicized and very troubling meeting um, that was held in late 2001 between um, Ledeen Gorbanifor, Larry Franklin, and Harold Rhodes. These are people who are extremely high up um, in um, what, what we call the neocon uh, thread of the cabal. And Ledeen, for instance, um, is uh, of the American Enterprise Institute, which hosts another number of names. Um, I believe Stephen Hadley, uh, who was a national security advisor at that point, was there. And um, there are links to um, Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage. Um, we are talking about a sterling cast of characters who are sitting down together in Italy uh, talking about the documents which we now know are forged. Mm-hmm. And we also have a good suspicion of who forged them and what uh, the person we think was um, supposedly committed suicide in Italy earlier this year. And this brings us to um, back to the same cast of characters um, that are affiliated with the American en- Enterprise Institute which this year just reconvened um, something called the Committee on the Present Danger. And I refer to that as a neocon love love fest with the usual suspects. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the day I met there was a day I got hit by a car in Herndon, Virginia. So, I mean, I will put that down to coincidence right now, but um, it really didn't do anything uh, uh, to... Um, in other words, uh, I, I, it's very hard for me to think that was coincidental. Right, sure. Now, I believe that the purpose, that the, at that point, they were negotiating the next step to get us into Iraq and Iran. And um, why would they want to do that? You know, when we step back and take a look at the significance of destroying a global WMD search team um, to uh, getting us into a war in, in the Middle East, what really are they up to? Is it just about oil? And the answer is, as we know, no. Yeah. Um, and um, one of the, when PTAC first fell in my lap, um, I spoke to some of the top um, experts in the world um, on terrorism financing. And um, one of them, Loretta Napoleone, um, everyone has their idea uh, on it, but when you rationalize all these threads and ideas, it is clear that what is being what we're being ushered into is nothing less than the age of terror. What that means is uh, it, what is being globalized is the economy of terror, where every aspect of our economy, our daily lives, are mandated by um, the uh, uh, by a blueprint of terror. So it and affects us all the way down to the consumer level, of course. All the way down to the consumer level, and you will see this reflected by the RFID chips by the Patriot Act 2 and 3 and 4 that are coming, and so on and so forth. Your every step will be uh, will fall in a, in a world that is controlled and monitored by extreme terror that has been engineered and set up by basically the Bush crime family, the, the cabal of 50 to 100, 200 uh, top people, however you want to, you know. Right, right. Uh, um, and, you know, they're foot soldiers. I, I see... Uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, for instance, um, uh, you know, very in much the same way I see John Kerry when he investigated, and the other investigators of um, the big crimes in our nation's past, which Iran Contra and BCCI. These were all um, uh, vehicles and venues that enable and uh, us to move to this point 20, 30, 40 years later. Yeah. He, uh, you know, first. The, He's a foot soldier for them, and he reminds me of John Kerry because John Kerry, who is supposed to be a hero in the BCCI investigation, he prosecuted yeah. you know, these things. 
he made sure that certain things were exposed, but certain things weren't. Okay. And, and Dara, hold that thought yes. right there. We've got to take this break. And sure. uh, when we come back, I want to pick up on that thread, okay? Yes. And Dara Singh is my guest. And uh, we're going to not take calls at the moment, but uh, later on in the program, we will open the lines to your calls. And I'm sure a lot of people will have some questions. Uh, of course, this is a very, very big story. We'll be right back after the break. I'm Michael Corbin, and you're listening to A Closer Look. And uh, she is an incredibly courageous whistleblower because, again, this woman has done an investigation, uh, a blue ribbon investigation into the threads that run throughout the 9-11 tragedy that occurred in New York on September the 11th, 2001. And uh, what you're hearing, again, folks, is exclusive material of her investigation uh, and uh, it, it goes into some incredible places. Uh, Indira, welcome back. Thank you, Michael. Okay, let's jump back into uh, where we were before we took the break. Yeah, we were speaking of uh, playing bait, the significance of that, and uh, really, um, the bottom line, the, we come across the usual suspects uh, that feature high in the Bush crime family cabal, and um, which, as we say, is bipartisan and transnational. And the significance of that is that American heroes were killed by that outing, the outing by someone like a Jeff Gannon and uh, funded by Bobby Eberly's GOP USA working for Karl Rove in the White House, who just, I understand, got a free pass today. By the way, Jeff Gannon listens to this program. Mm -hmm. Well, he should. Yeah. And, um, and um, uh, let's see if he can, you know, if he has the... Uh, brain cycles to understand these connections and what and then their significance. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, anyway, the, they destroyed a global WMD search team. Uh, um, operatives were, um, were were killed in the process of doing work against this terror cabal, and uh, it was worldwide from Pakistan, different countries, and and so on. And and it really upset a lot of people within the CIA, and a lot of them started coming out. Um, Speaking, helping, giving information that would help um, investigations such as such as mine, mm -hmm. um, and so that's the significance of, of that today. And of course, then we focus on Patrick Fitzgerald. And in my book, he's just another John Kerry. He, I guess they're grooming the next generation because he he's a part of a, a breed of he's a special prosecutor, not an independent counsel. So he's not required to give a report on on what he discovered. But um, he has the um, inside players and cast of characters and knows just how far to go uh, so as not to upset the cabal. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he did, and I've been watching him since 2002, 2003, for giving Inam or not of uh, Benevolence International Foundation um, a free pass, because Inam or not was, was the one ace in the hole they had that could connect could bring this entire thing down. And, of course, he's connected with the Muslim Brotherhood in Chicago and Boston and through that directly to the members of PTEC and the four or five um, um, uh, money laundering and um, smuggling companies that were affiliated with it. Okay. And um, with that, you know, we should get into the core of what we have now. I've spoken on this program before about... Um, <clears throat> about whistleblowing on PTEC, which, oh, by the way, has changed their name as um, all these companies that work with the cabal eventually do, and they're in, in focus. Um, as you know, a number of names were affiliated with, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, PTEC, and I've always said that if PTEC is the one place that you look, if you know what you're doing, the entire uh, cast of characters will be revealed. And we do have a transnational bipartisan cast of characters, um, and we've I've spoken on in the past about the Saudis that were involved with it. The Saudi bin Laden group was uh, was heavily involved. There were four bin Ladens involved with PTAC. And we all know the bin Laden group was a, has very deep uh, pocket ties to the Carlisle group, to Bechtel, to Halliburton, and so on and so forth. And um, we have Khalid bin Mahfouz, who is, who is Osama's brother-in-law, despite his suing 28 authors. And... Um, he is a current business partner, current business partner of former New Jersey Governor Thomas Kane, mm -hmm. um, who the very person George Bush appointed to chair the investigation of the September 11th Terrorist Act. But what, what's, um, what's really interesting about Governor Kane, as we've mentioned in this program before, is that he was doing business with people involved with PTAC. Right. And, um, you know, some of the other Saudis involved as 
with PTEC was Mohammed Alamudi, uh, an investor convicted for terror financing, uh, small convictions. Um, Yakub Mirza, who is a, ma- a sub- subject of a massive treasury investigation, Operation Green Quest, that was stymied at every step. Um, we have other people involved with uh, Namira Petroleum investing in, in PTEC, which goes back to Bin Mahfouz. And, of course, their um, boy, Yassin Al-Qadi, a Saudi sheikh, who is a member of the <clears throat> Saudi royal family. And he was the one that Bush's administration put on the terror list after 9-11. And, um, you know, someone asked me a good question. Why Yassin Qadi, uh, if he was such a buddy of, uh, um, of George Bush, and why not someone like Khalid bin Mahfouz? And my answer after investigating is basically he was the only one they could put on there, the only token offering they could put on there. Um, since he was a foot soldier of the Saudis, that could wear the trail to Bush and others and, and Cheney and, and the, the whole cabal could be managed quite nicely. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, now the significance of PTAC has every time that I've brought up the issue of the, it's, it's about the people behind PTAC, um, not necessarily the software, the focus, including the Secret Service and, and the as the focus they wanted to place on it was always that it was promised version two. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm sure your listeners all know what promised software was about and, and what happened to Danny Casalero, who was investigating promise, and he had discovered something called the octopus. Mm-hmm. Well, hold that thought, because we're going to come back to the lair of the octopus that comes all the way back to, to this. Okay. Mm. Um, now, all of these people um, mentioned here have very, very close ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. And we've spoken on this program before about what is a Muslim Brotherhood. And I want to make it very clear now that um, they may be Muslims, but they're not Muslims in the, in, in the sense that millions and millions of good people are Muslims, just as million, million, millions of Christians are good Christians. They're not Muslims. They use Muslims, and they use the Islamic religion to perpetrate their terrorist right. um, acts. Mm-hmm. Muslim Brotherhood goes all the way back to uh, World War II and Hitler and elements in the United States that banded with them. They're the ones, a Saudi Egyptian group that funded, helped Hitler fund the concentration camps, for example. So people should really understand who, who they are. They're terrorists. That transnational bipartisan terrorist has been going on mm-hmm. for that long. Mm-hmm. So having said that, let's move on to the Muslim Brotherhood and 9-11. All these characters within PTAC were members of the Muslim Brotherhood, including Inam Arnott. But um, one of the things that I've never um, talked about openly about what was actually going on behind PTAC um, takes us right to, um, uh, to, uh, to George Bush. Um, basically, uh, these names that Patrick Fitzgerald and... Um, uh, who was a Chicago U.S. attorney and and Agent Robert Wright, who also was in in charge of the Chicago FBI investigation into Yasin Qadi. Mm-hmm. You might remember that Agent Robert Wright um, knew uh, Fitzgerald, of course, and um, had had said right after 9/11, he stood on the steps of the Capitol in June 2002, and he burst into tears and said, "If his investigation into Yasin Qadi and PTEC and BMI hadn't been shut down and stymied, um, there would not have been a 9/11." Right. And I keep coming back to that. What exactly did he know? And here's what he knew. Um, we need to talk about the three. There were about three. I'm sorry. There were five people. It was in PTEC who not only worked at extremely high levels in PTEC, they were, for example, high enough that they were one of two people who had access to source code, but they also ran something called Care International. Now, the first question is, with a slew of charities on the 9-11 list as designated as terror fronts, why was Care International left out? Now, this is not the big Care International. This is a Care International that was, in, was run out of PTEC. Care, this is the one that was based in Boston, um, in Massachusetts. And what we found out about CARE is that CARE's addresses were the same addresses used by the Muslim Brotherhood organization that was located, for example, in Brighton, Massachusetts, and on Prospect Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We had the PTAC names affiliated with PTAC and CARE International, the, what I call the PTAC CARE International, the Muslim Brotherhood CARE International, um, Sahel Laher, 
I was a co-founder and member of the Muslim Brotherhood and PTEC and Care International. Mohammed Mubayed was a treasurer, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and PTEC, and he was also connected to World Trade Center bombing of 93. I wonder how um, Special Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald could have missed that in his um, prosecution of Enam or not. Mm-hmm. Mohammed Akra uh, was the president of Care International. Now, uh, these people were under investigation by the Boston FBI prior to 9-11. Acre himself was on the FBI terror watch list. Another name that came up was Samir Almonla. All of these people were involved with the core people that founded and ran PTAC. Now, on September 5, 2001, one week before 9-11, two Muslim Brotherhood companies, and I will call PTAC a Muslim Brotherhood company, and Infocom, they were um, related by these uh, terrorist connections that included Enam are not. Now, on, on September 5th, PTEC was moving, and I believe in that move, they destroyed and hit a lot of records, and a company in, and, and technology company in Richardson, Texas, by the name of Infocom, was raided. Mm-hmm. Now, Infocom is very interesting because they were ISPs to many, many of these um, organizations that were involved with uh, um, bringing us a uh, number of terrorist attacks, including 9-11. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, he was ISP to um, Anthony El Gindi, uh, the person that was uh, was allegedly accused, uh, uh, allegedly placed the airline 9-11 puts, and uh, who was the subject of um, other lawsuits and convicted several times by, by the SEC and so on. Wasn't this Invocom also involved in uh, distribution of child pornography? Was that another outfit? Um, th- it was... Uh, there were ISP to someone involved, to or an organization involved with um, pornography. I heard that. You know, I, I just wanted to ask you if that was yeah. true. Okay, go ahead. Now, um, Infocom was also, by the way, uh, ISP to um, Al Jazeera, and we believe that they were shut down by the FBI simply because the, there were some very good people there that would have um, spilled the beans. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of reasons to shut them down. Now, um, Let's go back to Boston and the Muslim Brotherhood layers there. Prospect Street, um, a Muslim Brotherhood hangout, was also where Dr. Osama Kandil um, was hanging out with the CARE and PTEC people. Kandil runs Biofarm in Herndon, Virginia, and that was a matter of great concern because of the um, bioterror aspects of uh, of this whole terror um, a, a, a blueprint. Uh, Mohammed Akra, who was president of CARE, the interesting thing is he had a base in College Station, Texas. These guys were not only in Richardson, but in College Station, Texas. Uh, look, And um, you know what college that refers to, the College of Texas A&M. A&M, yeah. Uh, which is Bush, Bush's uh, um, alma mater. Alma mater. Yeah. And, uh, well, prior to 9-11, um, Akra... Everyone is moving. The week before 9-11, all of these guys in the Muslim Brotherhood are on the move. He flees to the Sudan and cancels his credit cards. And um, uh, there is another Accra in Dallas who is from Nigeria. This is kind of interesting because this is part of the threads that connect for me into this rope of terror that's got this nation and the world, you know, under its grip. Yeah. Now, um, we're going to probably come back to this, but Nigeria features very heavily in the Cheney money laundering bribery scandal that the French are going to probably indict him for. Mm-hmm. Now, going back to Dr. Candil, who was with the Muslim Brotherhood and with all the PTEC people and Care International people, he's connected with Dr. Samuel Ariane of Tampa. So Candil and Accra are co-located at the same address in Cambridge, and so are the PTEC people. Uh-huh. Well, and what else do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is in this warehouse, is this, in this warehouse district in Braintree, Massachusetts. Now, this area and this warehouse and this trucking company that runs out of there are affiliated, according to the FBI and private investigator sources, to the Whitey Bulger mob. Um, oh. And um, that's significant. It's very significant because um, the Boston FBI raided among the or, by the organization that rates FBI considers the Boston FBI is one of the most corrupt in the nation because um, they basically let the mob run wild with the murders and whatever else. Yeah. Um, but going back to this address in Braintree, Massachusetts, um, listed there are a bunch of names <clears throat> uh, and five companies. 
five companies uh, where the people running these companies are closely affiliated with PTEC. One of the companies we've just talked about is Care International. Another one is Ecom. Another one is Logan Furniture. Another one is Bannon Information Technology. Now, the interesting thing about these things is that they all share the same address. It's uh, a warehouse. Now, it's one one room in a warehouse. If you go, now I visited um, 20 Plain Street, Braintree, um, some time ago, and I went there and um, went inside and went upstairs, and um, it's basically uh, just a warehouse. There are no offices. Mm-hmm. And um, the the companies lo- located there are, uh, share one huge warehouse, and um, when you take a look at what what's going on there, there's a lot of trucking in and out. I walked up to the Logan Furniture people, and I spoke with them. They said, I asked them, well, why do you call this Logan Furniture? He said, because of Logan Airport. And um, <clears throat> uh, the person who runs Logan Furniture is um, an Emad Montasser, and his name is um, comes up all over um, all over the the Muslim Brotherhood terror financing and other operatives. Mm-hmm. So um, Bannon Information Technology. These are all fronts. They're all cutouts. They're sure. just names. Um, Bannon Information Technology is actually a, a Texas incorporated company with an address at 20 Plain Street and in the Sudan. <clears throat> and um, also co-located there is something called the Geneva Capital Group. Ooh. And the Geneva Gra- Capital Group is kind of interesting because it's connected with a small Wall Street company with none other than Kalazad in charge. Kalazad, that name comes up in the um, Bush administration regarding Afghanistan and, and ambassadors and people in key positions uh, in Afghanistan and in, in uh, Iraq. basically Iraq. Yeah. Now, what we have here is part of the, of an elaborate money laundering scheme. They were involved with not only uh, smuggling uh, to Bosnia and Chechnya, but um, they were involved with uh, smuggling to Switzerland, um, Lebanon, um, you name the Middle Eastern com- country. Uh, they had they were shipping stuff back and forth from there. But at this point, we need to stop and see what we have. The people behind this quad of companies through their associations have well-publicized and historical access right into both President Bush and into President Clinton's administration. Mm. Now, and, and this is a matter of n- not of conspiracy theory. No. These are These are accusations and these are charges were brought against all of these people in court. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are going to move now into the other aspect of um, of what was going on with Bannon Information Technology that has never been made um, public in Care International. Okay. When I started investigating Care International, <clears throat> they still had a website up. Um, when I started in- investigating Bannon Information Technology, their website had had come down. When we took a look at these websites, it was clear that there was no business being being um, run run out of these. They were just fronts. A private investigative firm investigated um, the both websites and took a look at it and deconstructed it and um, came across some very strange pages. The pages they um, determined were um, <clears throat> quite likely used for uh, for conveying information through the use of steganography. Now, steganography is a technique that Al Qaeda and the 9/11 operatives and, uh, are used quite extensively. And what it means, how that works, is as follows: You can have a page uh, on a website and a picture, and embedded in the picture are um, basically documents other um, instructions, text messages, emails, you know, the Word documents, whatever the content can be embedded in there. And if anyone looks at the website, all they see is a harmless-looking picture. Right. I've heard this stuff before. This is kind of super spy kind of stuff, isn't it? It's absolutely super spy stuff. And at the time that um, I looked at it, there is, you, you can pretty much tell what, is used for steganography uh, to the practice eye is something that I've been in, been you know I've had some skills in it myself 
going back to the mid '80s, uh, um, actually to to the late '80s and early '90s, mm-hmm. and so you you begin to tell, you begin to recognize what it is. And sure enough, when we were going through, when I was um, being debriefed at CERT, the Carnegie Mellon um, Institute that worked with the Secret Service on um, on these on cyber crimes, of which they considered PTEC to be a cyber crime because of the software. Uh, from you know being promised to as they suspected, um, it, we looked at the the these sites and they, these experts looked at it and said steganography, and and it, yeah, it doesn't take a rocket scientist in this day and age to figure something like that out. And there is software that will deconstruct the images and you know try you, you could at least find that something is there even if you can't decode it. Right. So. Um, <clears throat> One of the pages um, was was extraordinarily significant because once once you sort of navigated your way through it, you went to lower and lower levels, and all of a sudden there were a set of pages where um, the code word um, Babylon um, was featured very heavily. So again, this is part to stop, a point to stop and say, well, what do we have here? Mm-hmm. We have here. A set of companies that have been covered up, that had ties to Geneva, ties to Wall Street, ties to Calizad, ties that were on FBI lists in both Boston and Chicago, where good FBI agents were stymied in, in their efforts to um, to research them. And at the core of these companies in Braintree is um, is a code word for an operation called Babylon. Now, what is what is significant about this, when we started looking at it, is that Babylon, of course, is Iraq. And the significant about this is that these people funding the smuggling of stuff, they were smuggling it into the areas around Iraq and into Iraq itself. When I first came across this and the WMD search in Iraq, I thought that for sure they would find it because from what I could see, we were shipping it to them. Mm-hmm. And um, if not in Iraq, uh, then definitely around Iraq. And um, when we thought about why would what would be useful to be shipped from the United States, well, it wouldn't be uranium or things like that. It would be enabling technologies, blueprints to build WMDs. And that is exactly what um, <clears throat> the people within PTAC who blew the whistle themselves said. Listen, this is we're not shipping, you know. Anything, if we're, if what is being smuggled out of here is not going to be drugs or whatever, it's going to be blueprints and it's going to be, um, you know, things like diamonds in which you settle. That's the currency of money laundering. And given Yasin Khadi's um, affiliation with the diamond business in South Africa, the blood diamonds, that is exactly what they they suspected were, were, were being shipped. Mm-hmm. So it was definitely um, a key part of um, how they coordinated their activities um, in in for Iraq. Uh, there is no question that these ties go right back to the neocons, to um, <clears throat> to the Bush administration, to the people within the Bush and the and the Clinton administration. Who we find popping up um, through through uh, our, our nation scandals. Mm-hmm. When when we saw the Babylon, I took this to some of the experts in um, who were expert money launderers, experts in, in, in worldwide terrorism and narco terrorism and and um, in money laundering to support terrorist activities, and um, their interpretation of it was 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 very significant. They agreed totally. And I and I said, you know, to one of them, uh, I said, don't you see that this indicts the entire um, Bush administration and, and the neocon cabal that seems to be, you know, part of the, the, the larger um, group? And um, they didn't say anything. They were absolutely, you know, they, they, they felt that they had, they had honed in and zeroed in on the, on the Muslim Brotherhood and yet at the same time honed in on the plan to invade Iraq. Yeah. Uh, Indira, hold that thought. we got to take the news break, okay? When we come back, yes. we'll continue. Excellent work, by the way. Thank you. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, getting this information out is going to inspire 
uh, you know, uh, good men and women in law enforcement to look deeper into this uh, into this situation and get this stuff brought out and get the people responsible prosecuted. You know. Anyway, we'll take the news break. We'll come back. Okay. We continue with this edition of a closer look. And again, uh, we're talking with Indira Singh, and uh, we're going to go back to her in just a moment. I just want to let you folks know that. Um, Currently, we're not opening the lines yet. Uh, she's got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, what we will do today at some point uh, during the uh, during the interview is we will open lines in case anybody has any comments or questions for her uh, about this incredible story. Okay, let's jump back to where we were before we went to the news break, and uh, we'll pick it up there, okay? Okay. Now, we have um, this code name, um, this project code name Babylon, um, operating out of uh, the PTEC uh, money laundering smuggling um, uh, cutouts, fronts, in, in Braintree. And um, the one that is of interest uh, at this point is Geneva Capital Corp., which is uh, connected with a, a Kalazad in on Wall Street. <clears throat> now, when I was investigating this, a couple of Houston attorneys, um, uh, I was in contact with them, and i leave it to the listeners' imaginations who they might be. And... Um, uh, they brought to my attention um, that there, that um, Gorbanifor, who was involved with the Plamegate um, uh, uh, situation, <clears throat> well, uh, when Iran Contra hit about the time uh, Fawn and Ali North uh, um, were shredding their papers, the um, <clears throat> uh, Gorbanifor was Gorbanifor, the Iranian arms dealer with connections to Mossad, was in his office in Switzerland. And um, in the same building <clears throat> that he was in was another company called Potomac Capital. And Potomac Capital is extremely significant. And when I started making connections between what these companies, Geneva Capital, Potomac Capital, and all these other um, cutouts and fronts had in common, <clears throat> I was warned that I'm into the brain and soul of the quote-unquote modern evil kingdom, so be... Um, very careful. Mm -hmm. So this is coming to me from people really uh, who basically are ex contra operatives who are pretty ticked off at where this country is going, yeah. and um, and telling me that I'm on the right track. Well, anytime somebody tells me I'm on the right track, I always think I'm not. But in this case, I was. <clears throat> now this gets back to um, what, what is all? What are all these? Uh, you know, alphabet soup and and myriads of names and cutouts and what does that what does it all mean you yeah. know you can't keep track of it and people have got enough on their minds just you know making a living these days well basically what it comes back is what to what some what a what a very good reporter um new york reporter called discovered is the layer of the octopus now the octopus was something that danny castellaro who investigated promise was had called he had excitedly told people that he had discovered this thing, this evil thing that that that, that um, uh, was really running the show, and he called it the octopus. So here it is in September 2001, after 9/11, and this um, <clears throat> reporter, investigative journalist in New York, um, this writes an article saying he's discovered that the lair of the uh, octopus is the OECD. Which is basically the um, the uh, a, a grouping of European Union and USA banks and government, which he discovered were the king of money laundering worldwide. Now, do you know what the o what does the OED stand for? The OECD, C you know, um, it, it is basically a consortium of um, European and uh, and and uh, U.S. banks, and I, I forgot what the acronym really okay. means because I've been using it for so long. It's been one of those where you, you just take it for granted. The Organization of Economic Something or Something. Okay. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an organization that includes European Union and USA banks and governments. And um, they're basically the kings of money laundering worldwide. And the sole purpose of the Cabal's group in, in running that is to um, is to um, fund the age of terror, the new economy of terror. And if you think that that's conspiracy, read Loretta Napoleone's book, Modern Jihad. And she's done <clears throat> 30 years of research into it. She's Italian, by the way, and um, knows from where she speaks. 
um, basically, he just uh, tied together um, the narco terrorism, the nexus of narco terrorism, and um, and uh, and um, money money laundering through a myriad of fronts, a hierarchical connection of, of fronts, and the fronts uh, do that are significant are the ones such as Geneva Capital and Potomac Capital, and um, of course all the um, offshore. Um, houses on the Isle of Man, the Cayman Islands, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Every time we look into this, it goes back to the same dirty group of people, which involves Cheney, who pretty much runs these operations in Nigeria, uh, and as well as other places, Vanuatu, um, which shows up in the Bush family connections, the Philippines, the Philippine gold and money that they, was looted and brought through a covert um, funding channel called Five Star. And that all came out. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the CIA members of the CIA got really upset after the, the uh, you know the, the Valerie plane was outed and all of those good guys got killed. And they validated a number of things for me um, regarding that. Um, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, <clears throat> so basically. The Lair of the Octopus, according to Christopher Byron, and uh, the article came from Belize, uh, no less, mm -hmm. um, was the OECD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what? Th this is this is an unholy web. It's so entangled. It's it, it it's so hidden. Um, by the time one researcher gets any traction on any of this. The name, they get wind of it, the names are changed, they shut down and it pops up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's been a game of catch me if you can for 50 years. Yeah, it's like a shell game. It's a shell game. Yeah. And it's, and, and that's a very interesting word because what Loretta, um, said, what, uh, her, her thesis was, and she proved, she proves it, is that we're no longer countries. We're nothing more, we're run by terrorist shell organizations. And the, the pattern of the shell organization always has someone in the Bush crime family cabal right. in, involved with it. The same pattern of um, looting, um, the same money laundering uh, conduits. Um, for instance, the one that um, uh, the, right now I think is very interesting that Flamegate is um, – being uh, trotted out because we know nothing is going to happen there. Right. Even if they got Rove, Rove is not a, a, a political figure. He was not an elected official. He's, he's just a civilian who occupies a, a notoriously and, and dangerously high-level role in the White House and controls a lot of policy. He's not elected. So they're not going to get to... to uh, he, they're never going to get to the people at the top of this. Um, they might get some of the foot soldiers, but, you know, uh, they, they'll be slapped on the wrist and that'll be that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but basically, um, the, the the looting that has happened in this country, um, starting with the SNLs even before that, the assassinations, the the, the shameful um, incidents, Iran-Contra and... Um, and BCCI and so on and so on. These were opportunities for Americans to wake up and notice that the same names were involved and get very worried. At this point, it is possibly too late um, <clears throat> because uh, the whole um, blueprint for the, this age of terror is based on terrorist shell states, which involve the same people, the, the same money laundering fronts, the same looting crimes, which is now global, and um, the same disenfranchisement of um, the ordinary civilian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, one of the things that um, <clears throat> that we want to do is, at this point, stop playing the catch-me-if-you-can game. Right. And um, uh, because if... If you if you take a look at at what really is going on, another smoke uh, smoke signal was the Harriet Myers uh, nomination. Right. Well, Harriet Myers knew all along that she was not going to be serious about it because she never even filled out her papers, the the the, the papers that they sent you to fill in so that they can do an investigative background. Right. She had absolutely no intention. She has been. Um, <clears throat> 
you know, basically uh, changing diapers for W since he got into trouble with the Texas Air National Guard, mm -hmm. and she's been playing, you know, clean up and cover up there. The interesting thing about Myers is that in playing that game, if you know where to look in her background, she is very connected with a firm called GTEC, which has, uh, which is in a lot of um, trouble, uh, has, has been cited for a lot of um, fraudulent activities mm -hmm. down in. Uh, down in um, Brazil, and they, of course, make uh, lottery machines, which by, they use the same technology as voting machines. Under, in, inside, they're, they're the same. And um, GTEC had contracts with the Lottery Commission in Texas, yeah. and um, that's a whole other, you know, um, investigation in and of itself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but she was nothing more than a, than a smoke screen. Yeah, I always considered her to be like a deflection, you know, kind of a distraction uh, you know, to, to keep uh, the eyes turned away from other things that were going on. Right. The, the, here's the problem that, as I see it, <clears throat> Patrick Fitzgerald is case in point. There are, we're at the point now, having not really nailed them good and well for these past um, serious transgressions, that um, we're, they're in a position right now where they're calling the shots on what is terrorism, who is a terrorist and what they can do about it, including right. the use of torture, has been approved by um, this administration. Right. Um, and the, the term terrorism has never been adequately defined. So uh, apparently if you spit on a sidewalk and they, do, they decide they have reason to get you off the street, they can pick you up for terrorism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, that's an extreme example, but that's exactly where it's, it's headed. Well, yeah. I mean... And, and, and there is no way... Um, uh, that we're going to get these people in a court of law at this point because they control they control it so well. Yeah, they've got it all they've got it all structured at the choke points of this nation. Yes, they do. And basically, you know, a lot of people ask me, "Well, Indira, you've been looking at this for three or four years, and you have more dots and more legal quality documentation. What are you going to do with it?" Yeah. Okay, Indira, hold that. We're going to come back, and we'll get into that as well, okay? Okay. All right, very good. The gallery of rogue players. I mean, you know, if you look at the Bush administration, uh, President Bush has been very busy appointing uh, past associates to key places in government, uh, and Negroponte, one of them, uh, Porter Goss from the CIA, another one, uh, and you just go down the line, and you begin to wonder, well, you know, what are we dealing with here? Now, as Indira's research has uh, progressed, she has been able to tie a lot of this stuff back to Iran-Contra and uh, and even a little bit beyond that because, uh, again, the American people, it just amazed me because I remember the Iran-Contra hearings in the late 80s. Uh, I was fascinated by them. But, you know, the one thing, even me at that time being uninitiated into, uh, you know, the, the deep research uh, that, uh, that I've done and that uh, other people have done, I, I could still tell that something was drastically wrong. Uh, and I, I find it amazing to me that the American people, uh, you know, even with that incident, that the American people would, would uh, kind of just kind of sit back and take a, a backseat role in this and not be outraged over the fact that our very own government uh, was distributing uh, and hooking kids on drugs. And, it, you know, this goes back to things that I have said before. You know, what is the justification? Is national security... Uh, a justification to commit moral wrongs. Does it mean that uh, just because they say, well, it's for national security, does it mean that they have a blank check? They have a, they have, uh, they're above the law. I remind you people that uh, you know when you get into that mindset about the idea that some people may be above the law, we're a nation of laws, and when you throw that out the window, just like we're seeing with the illegal alien invasion of this country, we're turning a blind eye to the rule of law. And I think that that can only lead to anarchy, or at least a, a serious breakdown in our society, which is, of course, uh, where these people want it to go. They want to take it to that, that extreme. And as Indira has said, her research has borne out the idea that we're, we're, we're entering what they call the new age of terrorism, a terrorist economy. And uh, Indira, would you, uh, would you like to pick up on that? Uh, yes, I would, um, because... The, the blueprint for an age of terror, for a terrorist economy, has been looked at uh, very jadedly and, and with, with, with extreme fear by serious experts in this business, mm -hmm. and, and, it is, and it is real. And it basically means that the civilian, 
will have no rights and um, you become just a resource and an asset of, of the government to be utilized in, in, in whatever way. Yeah, an economic um, unit of measurement to them. Exactly. And um, what you saw in Katrina um, is exactly uh, going to be the response for any um, fallout for, as, this, uh, as the incidents and events in this age of terror are, are, are conducted. Yeah. In other words, if you think that FEMA, which stands for people should really remember that it's an emergency management um, agency, and they're not necessarily running in to help you. They're there to manage the assets and the resources that are important to um, a, a terror-driven um, <clears throat> uh, cabal or, or government set of governments. Now, um, I believe um, that we're, we're talking about uh, the fact that this has gone on for so long and that I must have followed about three to 500 threads, significant threads, that tie back um, as, you, as you go back in, in time to the same group of people. And indeed, it goes back to the assassination of JFK, and, uh, which I don't get into because that's too far back in my research, and, but, but I do know that significant links are there. But as we come forward, um, you know, sometimes they ask me, what, what are you going to do with all of this information? Who are you going to take it to? And Patrick Fitzgerald, today I think is a very significant day in, in our nation's history again, because this is the day, this was D-Day for the indictment, and this is when we were going to find out whether he was going to be a real player instead of a cover-up artist. Mm -hmm. And um, we find out that he's essentially, even if he handed down the rumored 22 indictments, uh, today um, or not, um, it wasn't going to make a dent, any dent at all, in in significantly changing this. And and sometimes I sit down and wonder, what have I done? You know, um, other than have stellar, absolutely stellar information um, about about this this stuff, mm -hmm. unimpeachable information about this stuff. Where do I take it to? Yeah, you know, I've tried to take it to. Sure, you, um, you've testified. You've testified before committees. Well, I've testified in two senators' offices. I've testified to a number of Congress people. I've testified to the Open Committee, the 9-11 Open Committee. I have had people on the left and the right and up and down tell me that, well, you know, if you really listen to her, she's not making any accusation. She just states facts. And that, I think, is still is true. But what I'm going to do now is... is is move forward from that because, indeed, um, I've always thought that we could get a clean day in court. I always thought that the American people could rally together and manage to get a clean day in court. If we could get one clean day in court, we would end this. But that is not going to happen. And I have been saying quite openly, either give us our clean day in court or take a very dark black one in the back alleys. Uh -huh. And I don't want to see that happen because yeah. it's unnecessary. That's not what America is about. And surely we can forestall that. But that plays right into the hands of people who are um, gearing up for this age of terror. It plays. That's exactly what these people want. Yeah. And uh, hold on. We're going to take our break. Um, I just want to let you know, too, this is now official. Libby has just been charged in a five-count 22-page federal indictment. He's resigned his job at the White House. Uh, the charges included two felony counts for making false statements to mislead the grand jury. Uh, he was also charged with obstruction of justice and two perjury counts. Five indictments, again, were handed down in total. Karl Rove is still free. Okay, and uh, as Indira has said, uh, Paul Fitzgerald, Patrick Fitzgerald, is probably serving his tactical damage control purpose very well. Anyway, when we come back from a break, we're going to take calls. And Dear Singh is my guest. We'll continue. I'm Michael Corbin. You're listening to A Closer Look. We continue with this edition of A Closer Look. And again, joining me is Indira Singh. Uh, and she is a whistleblower. Uh, and uh, I, we've gotten a lot of calls off air, Indira, about your background. People are, are curious about your background, your credentials, if you will. We're going to get to that in just a second. But I want to open lines at this particular point. For people to call in if they have any questions or comments, particularly you know the folks that are in the uh, the 9/11 Truth Movement uh, should find your uh, your story and your research quite interesting because you have uh, basically in, a, in in independent ways you've refuted every official explanation for 9/11 that there is out there, and as you've said you know you've talked to key people in government but nothing seems to happen. 
You know, and it's, it's just sad. If you could just take a moment before we get back into the, the meat of this, uh, Indira, give us, give the audience, just kind of bring them up to speed on who you are uh, and how you kind of made the entree into this, uh, into this murky world. Okay, I'd be happy to. Um, the easiest way for me to answer that is if you Google my name, <clears throat> Indira Singh, <coughs> excuse me, um, and uh, 9-11 or WTC because there are one or two others out there, um, uh, you'll get a lot of uh, the documentation on me. But very quickly, I uh, have a very um, high-level information technology and um, financial uh, Wall Street background um, I've been around the block a number of times in, in, in different IT capacities, including the fact that I started something called Tibetanet to bring uh, um, <clears throat> technology to the Tibetan government in exile. And um, I, uh, at the time of 9-11, I was working as a senior consultant to J.P. Morgan Chase in their risk areas. And... Um, I also, at that time, was working as a, a senior consultant um, to an organization in Washington, D.C., called the Interoperability Clearinghouse that had um, ties with the CIA and with DARPA. Mm -hmm. I did not work for DARPA, but I worked uh, with um, the ICH, and my purpose there was to fund a company that would produce technology that I could use in risk to develop blueprints to stop bad things from happening um, on large scales. Mm -hmm. uh, in the banking was, industry, yeah. Yeah. My field was, um, I was merging the fields of risk management and enterprise architecture, and I was pioneering some pretty interesting stuff. I was, you know, really, um, you know, focused on that. And as a result, I know from, from I know stuff and people on the inside. I am a little appalled that when PTAC fell in my lap and I looked, I just thought that since I worked on Wall Street and so many of us had been personally hurt, lost people, friends and so on, right. I, not for a moment did I think that people would not stand by me and, and, and back me up. And, and that in, in the end really reveals how scared they were and how stupid and naive I was. Mm -hmm. And I admit to that freely. Um, uh, that I didn't understand what was going on. They did, and they backed off. The answer I got over and over again is, um, I've got a family at home I've got to be worried about. I said, worried about what? You know, we're exposing terrorists. And they said, you don't understand. I said, well, then tell me and speak out about it, and they won't. And I would say, what kind of world are you creating for your children right. if you do this? Mm -hmm. So I did, uh, um, in my position at J.P. Morgan Chase, I, I um, was involved with credit risk uh, for Operational risk and different risk areas, and I know a lot of, I know a lot of the um, money laundering vehicles uh, or vehicles that can be used for money laundering and were used to cover up a lot of things. Um, and I, uh, that's a whole other um, topic that we need to get into because um, the people on Enron and uh, the recent WorldCom slap on the wrist. Um, uh, I, I know where the bodies lie, so to speak, in that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to the fact that, I, as I saw in the terrorism investigation, it's exactly the same pattern. They'll reveal a little, but once it gets close to these names and these companies and these cutouts and these fronts, they'll shut it down. You're like chameleons. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we need to stop playing that game. It's conspiracy. Catch me if you can. You're this, you're that. We need to stop playing it immediately. 